to this very special event. My name is Walter Jo. I'm the director of the Cloud Center for the Study of Constitutional Democracy and a faculty member um, in the law school. This is our last event in a two-year series on the art and the culture of democracy. We started this series with an intuition that an understanding of democracy and constitutionalism cannot be complete or reliable if it remains at the level of institutions, norms, or discourse. We knew that we had to go deeper to gain a more profound understanding of the nature and struggles of the self, both individual and collective, that participates and is in turn constituted by the political and social practices of constitutional democracy. To gain that understanding, we thought we would do what one typically does when seeking to find one's deeper self. We turn to the arts. What is the role of the art in the culture of democracy? What does that culture do to and with the arts? Looking back today at our conversations in this series, it is obvious to me that we made the right choice. Poetry helped us find ways to think about the relation between the personal and the political, the I and the we. We debated here if the novel is inherently social and how narrative opens up the experience of the mind and reveals new dimensions of the self. Power lives there too. We talked about drama as a space mediating between the official account we give about ourselves and the reality of how we know ourselves to be, a space of anxiety, a space of freedom. We talked about identity and transformation, about a culture that sees itself as always in transit, about the experience of seeing and being seen. We talked, and it was not always easy to talk, about visual art, about music today. We use words, and rediscovering words, their power, their limits, their promise, is something we expected and we received from the arts. In that sense, we shared in the spirit of that extraordinary manifesto against illegitimate authority and crushing power that during the Prague Spring, almost half a century ago, its courageous authors entitled simply and wonderfully 2,000 words. I have two people to thank. Kim Garcia, the director of the series, my colleague and dear friend. Kim is a seasoned traveler along this path. She curated our conversations and with extraordinary care and wisdom, created a space for our guests in which they could find themselves and meet one another. Real human conversations are not like Plato's dialogues. They are full of false stars, of dead ends of apprehension, boredom, defensiveness. Plato, in writing, could stylize them. But on a stage, <coughs> on this stage, stylizing unscripted conversations is much harder to do. I express my admiration, my gratitude to him for having done it. And then Ed Hirsch. For the past two years, Ed has come to BC <coughs> always here at the appointed hour <laughs> Rain or shine. <laughs> Each of us has, has, has built a home, and Ed is poetry. What a home that must be. If poetry positions the soul and directs the mind to be in the world in which we have seen him here, witty, erudite, and caring, utterly rigorous, yet wonderfully non-academic. Then Ed, a champion of poetry and poets, succeeds in that task in the only way one really ever can, by making other one to experience ideas and people with a flair and gusto like his. Today is the last time we welcome him in this format, though of course we hope not the last time at BC. We cannot have you here for long enough, since that would be not letting you go. <laughs> and you have promises to keep. But you have made friends here, new friends here, and they will want to see you again. 
So I hope I have succeeded in raising the expectations for today's conversation and our guests' levels of anxiety impossibly high. I trust that they can handle it. Today's topic is music. Our guests today are Scott Olson Bryan, Kim Kashkashian, and Elijah Wall. Our practice is to direct you to the bios included in the brochure that lists their many accomplishments. We welcome you all and look forward to the conversation. Everybody, thank you for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be part of our conversation today about uh, music and its relationship to democracy. If you've come to any of these before, you'll know that I've worked every topic to begin by talking about poetry <laughs> and its relationship to the other art and its relationship to democracy. So today I'm going to begin by talking about poetry and music, and I want to especially talk about poetry and song. And it's going to get to democracy, but it's going to take me a few moments. In most oral cultures, in tribal cultures, there was no separate word for poetry and song. They were the same thing. It's only with the advent of writing later that poetry and music begin to separate. And that's really in the Renaissance. Before that, a poet like Thomas Campion doesn't really distinguish between poetry and music. They're the same thing for him. In many tribal cultures, if you tried to tell people that there's something different from poetry, that's different from song, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. There is no <coughs> separate word. We tend to think of rhythm and meter and poetry, especially in universities, as very elite forms. But in fact, they all have their forms. Every one of the most elite rhythmic, rhythmic elements or forms, rigorous forms in poetry, has its roots in oral tradition, has its roots in oral forms. And meter, song, and poetry come out of the body. I myself am especially interested in work songs. In every culture where there's physical labor, which is every culture, there are songs to accompany that labor, and those songs are poems. And so there are sea shanties. So in a sea shanty, there's one kind of song, which is music for pulling up the ropes, another for pulling them down. And for, there's music and there's songs for time to every kind of activity. Sewing, threshing. Uh, in the 12th century, there are French songs for weaving, chantant de toile, for every kind of washing clothes, for every kind of labor. Now, in West Africa, there were a tremendous number of songs for different kinds of rural labor. Those songs in particular migrated to the United States when we began to put people into slavery. There were field hollers, and there were what you know, maybe you've heard some of these chain gangs or work songs. Now, a work song is a utilitarian kind of music. It's a music that's timed to the physical labor to make it easier for people to do their work. It is completely transformative. The way it works is the way the work song in the United States um, of people who were forced into slavery work was just like West Africa, it was call and response. There was a leader. And he would be the one who spoke, and there are the people in the, who were working who would only respond. So it would go, take this hammer, huh. Carry it to the captain, huh. The group is working, the leader is saying the lines. Now, what's remarkable about this is this developed something that, you, that, that in African American communities we called signifying which is a way of making, it's sort of what the Eastern Europeans did to avoid censorship. It's a song that sounds like one thing, but actually means something else. It sounds like it's addressed to the boss, but actually it's quite radical. Take this hammer, huh? Carry it to the captain, huh? Tell him I'm, tell him I'm flying away, huh? Tell him I'm flying away, huh? Like that. It's a revolution in plain sight, but it was completely missed because of the cover. But the most radical thing about this is it takes someone else's labor, someone else's work, and it changes it to music. In other words, to your own rhythmic time. It puts people into a kind of ritual hypnosis. And in doing that, it transforms someone else's work into your music. And by doing that, by putting you into that kind of ritual hypnosis, you stop time, or you transcend time. So that labor becomes dance or at least something closer to dance. It becomes transformative. This is one of the traditional ideas of the lyric, to stop time, to 
to move outside of regular time. Now, the work song almost certainly, and here's where we come to the democracy, the work song almost certainly turned into the blues. And the blues I'm speaking especially of the, the, the blues that have the rhyme scheme A, A, B. It starts with a field holler, it starts with call and response, but it's all sung by one person. It's a solo art. I'm going down the river, take my rock and chair. I'm going down the river, take my rock and chair. I'm going to go down there. To, if the blues come upon me, I'm going to rock on out of here. First line, the second one repeats and changes it. The third one transforms it, like a sonnet. It's a volta. It turns at the end. But the thing about that that's remarkable, the place we move into American music, is the call and response is sung by one person. Instead of there being a chorus between one person singing one thing and the chorus responding to another, the singer becomes his own chorus or her own chorus. Now, that's an American move, because it's a move towards an individuality. There's nothing, this kind of individual ethos did not exist in African art. It exists in American art. And thus you take a transforming experience, you turn it into a solo art, and you begin to have a democratic American music. Now I could do that with almost every form that we think of as classical in the United States. So this is the way that Americans began to stamp a communal music. We interiorized the same call and response pattern, but we made it part of the individual, and therefore singing of his own grief. Now, you could say that that also encapsulates, encapsulates the grief of the community, as it does, but it also creates a space for individual feeling. And this has been one of the continuities of the whole series in terms of American art. The space for the individual feeling is one of the deepest characteristics American art in every one of its formats. And it's true in music as well. So that's what I'd like to say to start. Thank you. What a wonderful leading. Um, I'm here as probably an extreme minority, um, a classical musician. We think of classical music as starting with Boring Bach and moving into Boring Bartok and further along into Boring Stravinsky, into Boring contemporary music. I would like to get rid of the word classical and use the word composed. So it's a form of architecture. Any music that has been put down on paper is a composition, just like an architectural drawing or a poem. And if we think of it this way, then the question for us, classical musicians, <coughs> becomes, how do we create a more universal access, <coughs> democratic access, to composed music? Right now, in this country in particular, we are in a situation where if you have gone to public schools and you didn't have musician parents, the chances that you encountered and were educated about what we call composed music is probably one in a hundred. That's not good for our audiences. That's not good for the sense of participation between audience and musician. The sense of give and take. The sense of a permeable membrane. One of the things that has developed in the past maybe 100 years is that sense of pyramid structure. If you think of classical music, you think of Yo-Yo Ma or Emmanuel X, or back in the old days, Ben Clyburn. And where did you see them? You saw them on a stage, up here. And you guys were all down there watching, and it was fantastic because they were the big hero, and they were doing something heroic. But that's only one way to experience and to share in classical music, composed music. 
Um, I would postulate that that pyramid structure has to be minimized, if not destroyed, and that we need to develop a give and take, a sense where the audience is partly responsible for the event called a music event. Okay, now how do you do that? An audience of, let's say, non-educated ears, how are they going to know what's going on? I believe completely that we don't have five senses, we have six senses. And that sixth sense is recognition of the golden mean. Now you all know what that is, or the Fibonacci number. Somewhere around five eighths, to be very imprecise, but somewhere around five eighths. In all elements of great composed music, you find that's the climax point, where the golden mean is. Same with architecture. You spread it out, you put it, flatten it out, and you say, okay, that's where it is, five-eighths point. Probably the same with a lot of novels. I haven't looked into that aspect. But it's also something that we see in nature. The snail has that. Many, many forms in nature Ex we can see and experience, whether we know it or not, that sixth sense, which is the golden mean. I think that is our entry point for anyone who <coughs> is not trained as a composed language musician to understand, to love. As Monet says, it's not necessary to understand. It is necessary to love. That's to be remembered. We don't have to understand. We have to love it. So, taken from that point, how do we get people to actually listen? Why is it that when I visit Armenia and I'm taking a walk with a composer, a contemporary composer of difficult contemporary music, we can't get one walk down the street without people stopping him and wanting to talk to him. Why does that happen there? Why does it happen that when we go into a museum, the entire office, nine people, stand up and say, oh, Mr. Mansurian, I, I heard your last performance. Can I have your autograph? When we're leaving the museum, a class of five-year-olds is brought by their teacher to shake his hand. And he sits there and shakes all 30 hands, and they're all like, oh, that's Mr. Mansurian. Who knows him? None of us. He's the most popular figure, I think. Is that true? Still the most popular figure in the entire country of Armenia. What makes that happen there and not here? Okay. It's access for children, access for children to the speech and the grammar of composed music. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit to what you were saying. Um, there's always a grammar, and a grammar has a rhythm. And the rhythm of music and the grammar of music is always understood by everyone. That's the golden mean. <coughs> It's just that in this country, we're a little bit afraid of it, most of us, because we don't have that growing up access to it. I think we used to, maybe, well, 50 years ago I did in the public schools. It's very rare now, and it's something that needs to come back. I'm, another funny story, kind of the opposite, illustrating the American side of the problem. A few years ago, I'm not tooting my own horn, but I got a Grammy Award for a recording. And what happened? It was announced, and the first thing that happened all over the social media was, oh, 
oh, I didn't know that Kim Kardashian played the viola. <laughs> that was the response. Because it was impossible that anyone would have known a classical musician who wasn't a yo-yo ma, or on that level, pyramid structure level, of a yo-yo ma or a Kardashian. So I couldn't exist. This, this would be great if it could change. Now, how can we work on changing it? I think that moves into another area, um, the area of social action and music. What can we do to create a situation where a concert has a dual purpose? A purpose that is not only to hear great music, but for the audience to feel that they are valued and responsive in the best sense of that word, which means active. A couple of examples of how that's working around the world. Um, have any of you heard of the Land Philharmonic? I'll tell you about it. It's in Paraguay. In Paraguay, there's a town which is basically a landfill. That's how it functions. All the garbage from all over the country gets dumped there. A few years ago, a guy <coughs> who just had a thought said, you know, we could do something with this garbage. We could do something useful with all this garbage. And he started making violins, violas, cellos, <coughs> flutes, trumpets. He made a whole orchestra out of the landfill garbage. And he involved all of the people who were workers, who basically were there to sort the garbage, and they made their living that way, in collecting the stuff that would make instruments. He made enough instruments for a small orchestra. And he taught the children of the town to play these instruments. Within a year, they were playing concerts going to London, being celebrated as something very special. Look it up. If you can look on, what is it called? <coughs> Internet. Internet. <laughs> <laughs> Landfill harmonic. It's quite amazing to listen to. They're playing Mozart on trash. OK? Mozart on trash. Trash has been made valuable. The town has been made valuable. The parents have been made valuable citizens. And their kids have something to do with their lives. They're learning responsibility, discipline, and love, and commitment all through this music. That's what we have to get in every city, <coughs> even in our great United States. Maybe not with trash instruments, but the idea of response from normal people. So another great example, community, you want me to stop? Maybe we should close up. Start the conversation the next I'll just stop. <laughs> Remind me of community music works. Everyone here, we responded when you won a Grammy as, wow, we didn't know a composer was a celebrity. <laughs> that was how we responded here in Boston College. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Scott. Um, I want to thank you and the class of for inviting me to be a part of this. Sorry? Am I on? Can you hear me? I think I'm on. The green light is gone, right? Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to read something that I prepared. Um, I'm not going to. It's sort of a riff, but you'll kind of get it. Um, I should start by saying that this sort of comes out of some recent thinking I've been doing now that I've finished my dissertation a few weeks ago. Um, and um, now that I'm done writing, quote unquote, um, I wanted to take my mind off the intense experience of writing and researching. So I've been going to watching TV shows um, that my friends have been reading about on Facebook and Twitter these past few months. The main two that have occupied my time are Underground, um, a show about slaves escaping a huge plantation in 1854, and People vs. O.J. Simpson, a Nazi drama about the trial of the previous century. Um, as I watched both, 
and entertaining as they were, my mind continued to flash back on my dissertation on the themes of citizenship and culture which dominated my research. My dissertation thinks about the ways in which marginalized communities use culture, or in the case of my dissertation, popular culture, to embed themselves into the national narrative of citizenship in the US in the 1970s. I work on the 1970s because I'm interested, too, in the ways that popular culture performed what I think of as cultural citizenship work. And by cultural citizenship work, I mean um, using culture to um, make advances that aren't necessarily legal or political, for instance, voting or you know, some citizenship things that we do. Um, and thinking about this between the advances of the civil rights movement when black folks were given significantly more legal and political rights as citizens, while they also had less access to the means of cultural production. So between that time and between the rise of what people call crossover culture in the 1980s, when the technologies of production and consumption exploded, and popular culture, meaning music, film, TV, sports, um, became a much more significant vehicle for black success in the US. So it asks, like, what, were the, what was the narrative of change that dictated this shift? What were the narratives of race relations which inflected this shift? And as I grappled with and continue to grapple with this idea of narrative, I find that I always went back to go back to and went back to a line from perhaps my favorite American essayist who, along with James Baldwin, I consider one of the finest essayists of American manners, and that's Joan Gideon. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. That's the first line of The White Album, her seminal 1979 book of essays. In this book, and especially in the opening essay, which gives the book its title, Gideon blends the Black Panthers the Manson murders, and a recording session with the doors, among other things, together into a heady panoramic examination of the paranoia and unrest of the 1960s. I found it fascinating that Didion chose to title her book about the tumultuous 1960s by using the commonly mistaken name of the Beatles album that seems most symbolic of, this great, of the great band's impending fracture. Things do fall apart, right? All good things come to an end. But I find it also completely appropriate to thinking about how culture, popular culture and music especially, has operated as a site of struggle and self-definition, of celebration and trauma, of identity and community. And I think about the music I write about, black music, African American music, and the struggles of the people who made it, who shared it, lost it, and are defined by it. Black people, I think, make music as a way to tell stories and they tell those stories in order to live. Like literature and visual art during the Harlem Renaissance, for instance, or like poetry did for Phyllis Wheatley, music has been a route through which black folks have worked to enshrine themselves as human, as embedded in the national narrative of citizenship and democracy, as contributors to this project that is the United States of America. As black music has, been, has existed as both somehow foundational of and yet marginal to the making of American culture writ large, the cultural production of black folks is deeply embedded with political undertones. And these undertones have come out, many think, most forcefully in the arena of hip hop and rap music. I once called rap music a kind of breakbeat concerto, dedicated <coughs> to showing the rest of America how young black folks, especially those of lesser means, who felt removed from the access to privilege, think and feel about the world around them. Rap was a wake-up call to the nation, to the world, that as we've learned to say, and hopefully believe in the present historical moment, that black lives matter. But even in that context, I've also written about, written that I think of rap music as hip hop, as a coterie of poor black kids pretending to be rich for the entertainment of rich white kids pretending to be poor. <laughs> That may sound more critical than it's meant to be. But what I mean by that is one of the brilliant things about rap music and the way in which it is so similar to rock and country and so many other genres of American music is the way in which it inspires acts of imagination and acts of sharing and as a site of becoming that only culture, popular culture, can accomplish. And in those acts of imagination and sharing and becoming, hip hop and rap music speak to the reach for dem democratic participation so often denied, seemingly, 
to the marginalized communities who do nonetheless contribute to creating together the fabric of democratic ideals which claim to enshroud, accept, reclaim, and protect us all. The slaves depicted in underground, interestingly so scored to the anachronistic beat of contemporary rap music, are telling themselves a story to counter the narrative provided to them by the limits of the nation at the time, and using music, in this case old gospel-based lullaby song with the hidden message of escape embedded inside to find their freedom. That reminds me of what you're talking about. Earlier. The O.J. Simpson show also uses rap music to underscore scenes of both victory and strife as the trial was a supreme example of the power of narrative to counter <coughs> truths we'd rather not deal with and reveal truths about citizenship and democracy while also obscuring them, the use of rap music to display that resonates in unexpected ways. In 1976, to conclude, legendary composer Leonard Bernstein joined forces with lyricist Alan J. Lerner to bring to Broadway a musical about the White House and its occupants, presidents, slaves, and servants from 1800 to 1900. Titled 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, it was called the Bicentennial Musical. Performed as a play within a play, with the actors providing commentary on the historical events that they're actually performing in the show, the musical posited America, as the opening song goes, as quote, always in rehearsal. As an always developing project, a process of change and discovery, in many ways, the show was a bold and exciting idea, offering a critique of American values, using the vivid tableau of the history pageant to comment on the shortcomings and dark underbelly of both contemporary and historical American political change. This idea of America as a rehearsal, as a site of development, as a mutable process rather than a fixed thing resistant to change, is an important one, and it does linger through the cultural work of the descendants of those White House occupants, presidents and slaves, leaders and servants. It is in many ways the meaning of what we talk about when we talk about democracy. And music has always shown us the way to rehearse it, to achieve it, to believe it. It is a story we should consider telling ourselves always.
Um, a lot of people in this room may really don't fight the power from public enemy, but that was the Isley Brothers. That happened when I was in high school, so I'm very familiar with it. Um, that was in 1975, and I'm local. I'm from around here. So I remember that also as the year of the busing, court-ordered busing to integrate the Boston public school system. And one of the weird facts of that moment is that South Boston, when it resisted the buses coming in with kids throwing rocks to keep black kids from going to their schools, their anthem was fight the power. They were blasting it out of windows all over Southie um, as a way of protesting the government power that they saw as destroying their world. This was the democratic protest in the streets against the evil government. I could describe this as music bringing people together. People on both sides, God knows, were listening to the Isley Brothers. But that's not normally how we frame what I'm describing. Um, another story. My father, um, he was a Jewish kid from Brooklyn. He was the first member of his family to go to college. He went on to graduate school, got a doctorate in biology, and then went to do his postgraduate work in Heidelberg in Germany. Um, he remembered it as a lovely medieval town. It was wonderful for him being out of this noisy New York in this beautiful old European stone village. And every morning, he would wake up and hear these young men walking through the streets singing together. And he always remembered how beautiful their voices sounded. Those were the brown shirts. Um, they were singing the Horst Wessel Lied, the anthem of the Nazi party. My father knew that. And he hated them, and he feared them, and he always remembered how beautiful the singing sounded. I'm not going to fall into the fallacy of, yes, Hitler was elected too. He wasn't. It's more complicated than that. And honestly, I don't believe the citizens of the United States are about to elect Donald Trump president. <laughs> but this is certainly a particularly easy moment to make the point that democracy is a messy process. Um, and music of the people, by the people, and for the people is equally messy. I grew up in a world of folk music. Um, singing together with Pete Seeger and the SNCC Freedom Singers. I, my latest book is on Bob Dylan and Pete Seeger at the Newport Folk Festival. That's what folk music meant to me. I remain nostalgic for that time and that music and that feeling. But when I traveled to Germany as a folk singer in the 1970s, I found that young Germans still avoided pointedly singing any German folk music because they still associated their folk traditions with the Nazis. Um, I don't mean this to be downbeat. I have devoted my life to music, and I believe deeply in its power to unite people, and I believe deeply in democracy. But I also believe deeply that the world is a complicated place, and that we need to be willing to deal with its complications, and to recognize that big, amorphous, in some ways meaningless concepts like music and democracy mean very different things to other people, and even to us in other situations. So for now, um, I just want to end with something completely positive and uplifting, which naturally brings me to an artist who, in the last few years, has been uniting people all around the world um, with her positive messages, uh, Katie Perry. Um, I would play Perry's own version of Roar, an anthem of empowerment that has been embraced by young singers and musicians literally all around the world. Uh, but my wife just yesterday, when I suggested that, suggested another video which makes the point even better. That's my wedding picture, sorry. Um, so let me finish with this. A version of Katie Powers, Katie Perry's Roar by the PS22 class from Staten Island.
very, very high. subject is democratic participation. They we're coming at it from different angles. And we're looking to find a way or thinking through a way that America's polyglot culture can be represented in all different kinds of music. From music that's wildly popular um, to music that seems really important to all of us but isn't so popular. And we're trying to make a space for what I also like to think of as, you know, used to be folk song, but also a space for the real power of hip hop, but that can also make space for an authentic American music like Charles Ives, or Bernstein, or Gershwin, or Carl Ruggles, um, or Charlie Parker, a really authentically difficult music, but still absolutely crucial as a kind of improvised music working at the highest possible level. And it seems to me that that's a real challenge for democracy to be as inclusive as possible to represent the full range of what's available musically and not just be determined by commercial interests. I think the attack is not on popular music. The attack is on a kind of packaged, pre-packaged culture. And it seems to me that when media ratings are determining what's getting produced, then you have an issue. We're trying to build a culture, I think, in relation to democracy and the arts, from my point of view, that in which everything is not always bought and sold all the time. And that the, the, the value and the determination is not entirely materialistic and is not dependent on who can sell the most things to the most people because we do live in an unprecedented situation where people are trying to sell us something all the time now. And the idea is, is there a way to create a space for art in general, and music in particular, that isn't just dependent on the bottom line? And to have a thriving democratic culture and a thriving musical culture, it seems to me democratic participation of music of all sorts is what's really important. And that's what we're all trying to address in some kind of way. Does this make sense to you? Is the subject or not? Can we talk about sure. that bottom line and tell yeah. a little story? Sure. I'll make it short. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a poet. We have brief attention spans. <laughs> <laughs> Six years ago, we began a project called Music for Fruit. And it was an attempt to actually involve artists, audiences, in the community to make everybody come together as part of the community. Musicians played um, volunteer, and audiences donated money, and 100% of their donations went to a food bank, a local food bank. That's just a little background. Um, in our first year, the Greater Boston Food Bank, one of the heads of operations there, took a look at our project, scratched their head, and said, well, why don't they just write a check? That's uh, to illustrate your point. I mean, it's uh, that the art and the audience together create something of value that is not measurable, that cannot certainly be measured in dollars, and certainly not even in meals, which is how we like to measure those donations. Um, so we we're trying to do exactly that to create a situation where. Any one of us artists could go out and play a commercial concert and send that money to the food bank, and it would be more money. But it's not as valuable. The value is in the, what we call the permeable membrane between the audience and the artists and the community. I'm done. It's, what's so interesting is that there's something, for those of us who've been coming to this, to our, our panels, there's something so parallel operating in theater. Mm -hmm and in video art and artists about 
and in, in choreography. Uh, you see more and more people taking dance out of the dance hall yeah. and into the streets. Yeah. And it's, it's very parallel kinds of struggles to for a greater, larger participation of the audience and to break down the fourth wall, mm -hmm. to break down the wall between the presidium, as you say, and the audience sitting below. That's part of what a dem dem democratic art seems to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have to say I'm a little puzzled by the idea. Well, let me phrase this a different way. I was first a professional musician, then a professional journalist. And what I have seen both of those fields becoming is, in fact, less commercial. Um, nobody can make a living at them. Because to a great extent, both of them are now being done largely for free. Bloggers are putting up their work for free. Musicians are putting up their work for free. I right now am in fact, God help me, doing a project where I'm uploading a video every day of performance that is being seen by more people than normally saw me when I did concerts that I got paid for. I'm not saying that's a good thing. As I say, it robbed me of my livelihood. But I certainly am not seeing it as a moment to phrase it differently, this is a moment where we regularly are seeing people who have access to nothing in terms of financial backing, except having access to a computer, putting things on YouTube that are seen by millions of people all over the world. Um, I see plenty of things wrong with this system, but heaven knows it, it is in other ways pretty exciting. Yeah, there's a, um, there's as a former journalist, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, how, yeah, but I sort of agree with you in, in that there is a way in which, well, hip hop, when we think about rap music, for instance, like that comes out of a very, very democratic space, right? It, it was sort of forced to, right? Yeah. Music education being taken out of urban schools, taken out of schools, period, public schools, period. Um, um, kids were being sent to to rather than getting sort of day to day um, liberal arts education being sent to trade schools and or and a lot of them use that act the access to that equipment to create the music that they end up making, right? So there's a way in which the inability to have access, the lack of access to the means of production, right? And the also, also the um, kind of the lack of access to record companies or, you know, sort of created this music we think of as hip hop is rap music, right? Um, and what's going on now, which I see particularly in like young communities of color and queer, young queer communities, is the use of the internet as this site of cultural production, right? And this way in which getting one's sort of image and sound out is the operative thing. It isn't necessarily about the making of the money, right? But it is about the creation of the audience, which I think is really important, and the sort of the sort of sharing that happens with those audiences. Right. The, the, well, the problematic side to this, in a serious way, say for those of us who really love a certain kind of cool jazz that I grew up on, it was to me one of the heights of music. Say you love Mingus and Parker. To hear that music now, you got to go to a university. Jazz music is being protected by universities now. Um, because they're, well, let's put it this way, they're being taught in music programs around the country. I'm not saying it's not out there in the culture at all, but it's often you have to, it's often being taught. And that we have to find ways, we're trying to find ways so that things we care about that seem important to us are also preserved so that just, if you think that, for example, journalism is important, and that everyone's opinion is not necessarily equal on all issues, that sometimes doing some research matters, <laughs> for example. So, um, and sometimes vetting your sources still means something. And, yeah. and, and being edited means something. Then you need journalism. Yep. And if you have to find a way in the culture to protect journalism so that we have actually also a higher level of discourse with some responsibility, then you have to find ways that the democracy protects it, in my opinion. Otherwise, you just lose it. So you just, yes, you gain something, but you also lose a tremendous amount. That's really related to what you're talking about. I mean, also, I'd like to bring up um, a question, which is, yes, I think the internet has created 
a form of the spreading of information and therefore availability of information and therefore democracy. But I have to say that it's um, secondhand information. It is not the same to hear that jazz through a computer speaker as it is to sit in the room and receive the waves of that music as the person is actually doing the process of creating that sound. Improvising. Just them. improvising the sound, yeah. or theater, or dance, any of those things you can see. And it's wonderful that it's available through the internet. It is not and should not be confused with the actual event itself, the real time event in a room where people are sharing, where they can smell what's going on, taste what's going on, as well as hear and see what's going on. I have a question though. Yeah. How, is, how is the experience of, say, a 17 year old in, in Gainesville, Florida, finding Diane Reeves on the internet different than me in Long Island in the 80s as a kid finding Diane Reeves via vinyl on the radio. Am I missing something? I mean, I am I missing something? Or no, I, 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 and I, I don't think anybody's just doing on that. There is the experience of live music, but I have to say personally, to take your example, I was living in New York City for one year when I was in college in the 70s, and Charles Mingus was playing four blocks from me, and I couldn't afford it to go afford here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I wasn't a kid living in Africa or yeah. India. The well, access, obviously, it's better to be in a room with Charles Mingus than seeing yeah. him on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. But I've never lived in a world where there was an access to people like Charles Mingus for people without money. Right. And it's not a perfect solution, and God knows, I hate the term internet community. It's not a community, and I'll rail against modern technology, and I'm a Luddite in all sorts of ways, but boy, access to Mingus is not something that I think we had more of in the past. Or you are, or I'm not sure. I agree completely that this is, this is our problem. This is why the arts are not democratic because we don't have access. In reality, we have access secondhand, which is certainly a whole lot better than not at all. It gives a lot of information. It's not the same thing. And we should all be working towards at least asking the question, how do we make it available? How do we make it available? This issue has come up with every one of our panels. <laughs> um, in theater, it's a question of a tremendous number of kids who've never been to a play. In art, a tremendous number of kids, kids who've never been to a museum. And in fact, walk by the museum and feel it's not for them. A tremendous number of kids who've never seen a concert of modern dance, or contemporary dance. This has been one of the issues that's been going through all of the panels, is here we have the presentation, we think it was a really great art, sometimes not so great, but often really great. But we creating the access for it beyond the class system that's operating in the United States is really an issue for all of the arts. And music is showing that one of the oddities of music is at the same time, it's tremendous, there's a tremendously popular music. I mean, unlike say, well, I guess that's true in dance too, and I guess it's true in art too. There are radically popular versions going out all over. The question is, how do you complicate it, how do you enrich it, and how do you give you the full menu of what's available? You know what's fascinating? I, this probably is fascinating to you all, but it's so fascinating. <laughs> um, and maybe you want to just make me think of it. Um, this Sunday at Harvard, where I'm a grad student and a tutor, which means I live in an undergraduate house, so I spend a lot of time around undergraduate. Um, this weekend is Yard Fest, which is their spring weekend. Right, where um, for the last five years that I've been there, there's been some singer or um, musician or band, right? So just today, before I came here, I texted a student and said, are you going to Yard Fest? Who's performing this year? Huh. And she wrote me back and said, oh, it's a DJ named. And I had this reaction 
and it might come from age, and it might come from a person who enjoys live music, right? Yeah. And I respect EDM, I respect, you know, right. but the idea that they're all going to be standing on Harvard Yard Sunday, eating food and smoking weed and drinking beers, and there's just going to be a DJ on stage with a computer, not even return to it, yeah. with a computer, yeah. Yeah. playing for two hours. And it, it was really fascinating to me that I thought that yard fest, the idea of people congregating and coming to this outdoor space for music and to, to sort of share in the community and share in the, was about seeing live music being performed. And it was really interesting to think that, wow, it's going to be teaching. Why bring up one local initiative? How about School of Honk and Honk for those who do this? How many people in this room know what I'm talking about when I say Honk and School of Honk? It's sad, but there it is. Um, <laughs> There's been a huge movement that started in Boston of brass bands. And there's a huge festival that happens every October. There are brass bands all over town now. There are schools for brass bands all over town now that if you pick up an instrument and go now, you can join a band. They will find something for you to play. You can be performing this week. And there are kids of all ages, adults. I just met a woman, black woman from Dorchester in her 60s who just picked up trombone, which she had played in the band when she was in school. And she was just performing at the Hatch Shell with the School of Honk. Um, I mean, there are initiatives out there getting people out live performing. And I would say, it's, I mean, again, I'm going to be upbeat. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> Maybe we should open up and see if you have any questions or issues. Yes. I had a question about, so I don't know how, how common it is for people to, do, to see classical music performed and how often it happens for a given uh, <coughs> Okay. Uh, so I was listening about the classical music, and it just doesn't seem as popular. And I partially wonder if classical music is having a lot of problems, I don't know if it has these problems, but I assume it might have problems selling tickets or like getting people to come out. But it's just like, I've been to rap concerts and they're really cheap a lot of the time. And I wonder if just with this secondhand access and everything going on and the demand being lowered for it, if that, like the high price doesn't match like what people want, maybe if they did more concerts for lower prices, then maybe that would draw larger crowds, and I wonder if you think that that would help with access to classical music? I think it most certainly would. It, it, it would help very, very much. I want to bring up two quick points, and one is an organization called El Sistema, which is Venezuelan, and they were able to there's a great philosopher, social philosopher named Agrol, and he created a system where all the underprivileged kids were able to study music and gain access to instruments, and they created an orchestra that's been all around the world. It's been a huge success, and the conductor Dudamel has been, you might even have heard of him, um, grew up through that system. Now, the interesting fact there is that it was supported not by the equivalent of the Department of Arts, governmentally, but by the Department of Health, Sports, and something else, I forget. Social services, basically. And they believed strongly enough that it would be good policy, good health, good for all their citizens, if everybody was making music, because it creates discipline, compassion, um, recognition of community. <coughs> so that's why it worked. But it wasn't about the arts. It was about, this is good for the human being's health. And I think that's where our problem is in terms of um, both access and um, focus, is that it's not considered a, the department isn't right. You know, it's not about artsy fartsy, let's do something that nobody else does. It's so basic and so necessary, and it should be supported by that department of our government, or these, I don't know what it's called here. Education is separate, health is, is separate, but there, 
it's, it's like that category of activity should be considered part of our health. And that's, that's maybe why we have access problems, wealth problems, et cetera. Somehow along the way, the arts got associated with certain classes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's especially odd when you're talking about music, because everyone in the world understands that music is important. There isn't anyone I know I've ever come across who doesn't like some kind of music. Right. We don't all like the same kind of music, but everyone recognizes music. There will be people everywhere you go who like rap, but say they don't like poetry. <laughs> but, it's just poetry under another. They like music, but don't say they don't like rap. Exactly. It's, it's poetry under another. Yeah, it's just poetry under too. another name. As long as you don't call it poetry, people like it rhyming. It's all about transforming speech. Yeah. I remember a rapper once told me when I was interviewing him, and I called him a writer. Um, and he said, I'm not a writer. And I said, well, you write your rhymes, don't you? Um, and he said, yeah. He said, but I'm an MC. I'm a rapper. And I was like, OK. But if I think, and I said, if I think of you as a writer, is that a bad thing? And he couldn't, after a long conversation, he finally articulated to me that in his mind, and it sort of goes back to what you said about the class aspect of it, there's racialized aspects of it too, right. where in his mind, a writer is a white man or a white woman, yeah. right? So he was he couldn't even get to Baldwin or Hughes or yeah. Yeah. it was like or whoever, right? Yeah. In his mind, calling himself a writer, had no, wasn't even very yeah, legible for him as yeah, an identity, it's right? So it's sort of interesting thing about what race and the yeah. election of this conversation as well. Um, I, I wanted to pose a somewhat devilish question for, for music lovers. Uh, I'm sorry, did you say devilish? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you guys all talk about music's power to build a community, and I just wonder if music might also be contributing to the, the slow decay of American I mean, the reason that, that I asked that is one of the long-running surveys in the United States, the American Community Survey, and they asked people, how many close friends do you have that you would feel comfortable talking about something important with? And since 1980, that's gone from three to two, which mm -hmm. is actually a huge change. Right? Like one of the things we're seeing is the atomization of society. And I just wonder if, if music isn't inadvertently contributing to that. Right? Like, it used to be that music sort of brought people together here personally. It was like, hey, come over and listen to my new Led Zeppelin album. Now, and you know, they make friends. Now people don't make friends, but they got their earbuds in their hand, right? And I just wonder if this great thing, which is music, is sort of inadvertently contributing to this terrible thing, and how, how might that be prevented? Seems to me the issue you're talking about it has more to do with media and then with music itself. It seems to me that what you're talking about is, is a computer-driven culture. And the, the problems of the isolation that comes with people having entirely, not just around music, but around everything, having mediated experiences yeah. through music is just one example of people having completely mediated experiences rather than having direct one-to-one -one presences. I mean, this is just really prevalent as a discussion in the university now about whether we should have completely online classes, yeah. not bother to meet in person, or whether there's something to be said for meeting in person the way we're talking here. And so I think, yes, you're right. I think music is part of this in some way, with people experiencing everything alone. But I'm not sure the problem is music. It seems right. to me the problem is everything being mediated through screens. And it started with radio, as you said. Uh, this, maybe the beginning of that process was you don't actually have to go and gather together to hear someone speak. But it's going right. to be transmitted <coughs> in your own home. Okay, so at that point, the whole family was Everyone gathered. listened together. Every, everyone everyone yeah. listened together. Yeah. Now we've got the earbuds. <laughs> you know, everybody's walking down the street bumping yeah. into everybody else because yeah. they're in their own world. So but isn't, that, I mean, isn't that the problem of the I mean, you know better than anyone about the problem of the phones, where everyone is on their phones. Yeah. Everyone, everyone's on their phones. And music's on your phone. Music's on the phone, but everything's on the Everything, phone. Everything's on the phone. Everything's on the phone. Yeah. Um, I just want to speak a little bit out of nostalgia. And this question that I wanted to ask you is Prague, where music was for survival, 
Yes, in many ways. I mean, not only because it was love and reading, uh, and you didn't have like, lots of other material things to take up the space, but also it could be a way of expressing oneself that could avoid controversy or to court it. It could be anti-communist, it could be uh, safe, but you had families playing music together, you had uh, jazz every week that was cheap, you had classical music every week that was cheap, and coming, and there were father-son uh, jazz guys, and uh, in coming back to this country, what I could feel was the line come back, the stratification come back. I couldn't afford not sure what I heard. And I also couldn't hear jazz in the way that I wished and which would have heard before. There was something about the atmosphere there that was that everything was infiltrated with the arts, of, whether it was music or other arts. And, and how do you reinstate that infiltration is my question. Seems like maybe it's more of a comment that you made than a question. Yeah, um, but we're all, I think we all recognize the difference between, this is something you brought up, the difference between arts and culture in small countries versus large countries like the United States, mm -hmm. where <coughs> classical music or composed music, poetry, are, have been part of the cultural fabric of the country and part of forming a national identity. <coughs> which is related to what you were talking about and the sometimes negative side of that in terms of folk art. I would just say one thing, you know, we're pretty lucky in Boston. Um, I mean, if you want to see world-class string quartets for free, I mean, Harvard has a series at Payne Hall. All you have to do is get the tickets. They don't cost anything. Um, Berkeley, too. Berkeley does free concerts. I mean, there's free jazz all over the place here. And if you go down to Dorchester, there are bars with open mics where kids are, who are in the most locked down situation in the United States, are having that freedom to express either wanting to go with the culture or wanting to oppose it. Um, you do have to look for it. It isn't in your face the way it is in a smaller town with or in an area where maybe there's more emphasis on it. But God knows there's a lot of free music in this there town is, of a yeah. lot of kinds. That's also with the question for a lot of people. You want to find out about it? Hi. Um, so I am a professor of classical music at Harvard. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Poetics of rap. Um, and I'm not just that. Is that microphone on? Because we can't hear. I think it's one that's not very high. Wait, did you say I'm not just saying that because I'm a professor? But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. What a way to get an A. That's embarrassing. Who's the professor? Where's the professor? Uh, oh, right, it's right next to you. Yeah. 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 So, um, I wanted to, I had a few things I wanted to talk about. In our class, we recently talked about um, criticisms in hip hop and how people see hip hop and how it's portrayed in the media and things like that. And um, I thought it was really interesting that you guys mentioned hip hop having an agency and um, it being democratic in a, certain, in, in a sense. So you also mentioned that um, about 50 years ago, classical music was more accessible in public schools. Yes. And I was wondering if we could kind of draw parallels between classical music and hip hop in the sense that were there any criticisms at the time of classical music that we can kind of compare to contemporary criticisms of hip hop? It's a good question, but I think it's in the case of classical music leaving the public schools, it was more what we were discussing about where does it fit in the hierarchy and prioritization of the big picture government here? We do not have support for the arts. Because all the arts, arts, are, all the arts are All the arts, yeah. yeah. The first thing that goes is music. The next thing that goes is art, visual art. The third thing that goes is dance, because it's more closely related to sports. 
And God forbid the sports program should go. It won't. And we, we need to. We're actually in the gym. <laughs> gym, gym, gym class. Actually, gym class. 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 Gym I'm old and, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean I only wanted to reiterate the thought that arts, all the arts, and the expression of the arts is vital to our physical and psychological well-being. Go on. I was just going to say the difference between classical music and hip-hop is, from my point of view, tra classical music was not transgressive. And that so the problem with the school was it wasn't banned from the school because it was transgressive. Mm -hmm. The way you're running into uh, kind of social mm -hmm. censorship around hip hop. Does that make sense? Right. I was I'm old enough to remember when oh yeah I'm, I'm old enough to remember when when I was in elementary school we had a new, like we had a music teacher who had a piano right a portable piano would bring it to each classroom and we would learn classical music stuff or pop music stuff and I don't think that happens anymore it's for a while right but I also remember that. Part of classical or composed music was considered sort of the the sort of the established thing, right? So what I don't remember it ever being um, available, sort of ha being criticized because, as Ed says, it was the it was the mainstream legible thing, right? That everyone was supposed to know, black, white, poor, rich, or otherwise, you know. So hip hop. It, as, as we all know, right? Cleaves sort of, as much as it sort of brings people together, also cleaves some communities apart, right? Because of differences in thoughts about gender or sexuality or race or whatever, class. I mean, jazz and rock both have to face. That's what I said, they were hip hop face, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So aside from them being just music, there are no parallels to draw. There are always parallels. There are always parallels. This is going to be one of the more difficult ones. <laughs> I, would, I would say for you that the parallel is that all these forms of music are a, a deep and true expression of human need. You can see that if you look at the um, concentration camps and the kind of music that came out of that desperate need. And I would say that the music that we were all talking well, comes out of a desperate need to express and to find an equilibrium in yourself. And that draws it all together. And the fact that it's not seen by whoever is in power as um, a necessity, that's our problem. Yeah. You had a question. Okay, so. Me? Yeah. Uh, right on the microphone. I hope I don't get too uh, off topic with this. I guess a lot of this discussion is centered around um, creating a non hierarchical culture of art, a democratic culture of art. Uh, particularly, it seems to me, with regards to preserving sort of what we already have, sort of past, uh, past art forms, maybe. I wonder um, is it possible? that uh, all really compelling music and compelling art uh, exists in rebellion and opposition to authority, in which case any kind of um, attempt to make a accessible framework for art will just arise in developing a new sort of authoritarian regime, which the next generation of art will end up opposing. Right. In which case, and I ask this as an artist myself, um, really, why should we worry about, you know, um, making art accessible? I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of moving parts to your question, um, which is the great thing, which is actually good. Um, but it made me think of a lot of different things as you were asking it. Um, I think access to art, the sort of democratic access to art or music with different kinds of music, is on its face a good thing, right? That's a good thing. But I think that's different than sort of hierarchies, of the hierarchies you're talking about. Um, like I have real issues, for instance, with the sort of gatekeeping aspects of how we think about popular culture, right? Like, for instance, at Harvard, there's a hip hop archive, um, and I see these popping up at a lot of different universities, and it makes me wonder sort of what is this sort of, is, has hip hop sort of been in its 40 years of existence? now sort of reach this point, right, this sort of this sort of territory where it's not this sort of raw street, um, cutting edge thing that everyone sort of thought it, called it, right, positively or negatively, 
but now it exists in the university, right? On a, on a pristine floor with you know, sneakers and, and spray, spray paint under, under glass, right? Like it's, it's, being, it's being sort of, um, it's been sort of like taken up by the gatekeepers of culture, right? Um, and is that always a good thing? And if so, when is it supposed to happen? Is there, should we wait longer than 40 years? Is 40 years long enough to think about hip hop is suddenly something that needs to be studied and something, right? So, so I think access, like to go back to the first part of the question, the access is something we should always fight for. Whatever kind of music we're talking about, whatever kind of culture we're talking about, this culture can't sustain itself if people don't have access to experiencing it as a way to reproduce it, right? There's that. Um, but the hierarchy thing you talk about is real, and, uh, and the, the ways in which we sort of decide what's important and what's not important, what's good, what's not good, right? What should last, what shouldn't last, is complicated, right? And I think we should always push back at what gets, especially as an artist. So you're on your music, you make music? Uh, no, I'm a uh, creative writer. You're a creative writer, right. You, you are always probably, you're always going to be in conversation with and probably a little resistant to the generation before you or the generation, two generations before you, right? You, you'll be remixing, to use a hip hop phrase, what has come before, right? What the problem I sort of have oftentimes when we talk about generational shifts is the sort of ways in which cultural history gets lost. And there's a way in which I oftentimes feel like I have students, I mean students whose cultural history doesn't go beyond four or five years. And that sometimes can be really weird to operate with because I don't want to necessarily, like I said earlier, sort of judge what's good and what's bad for them. They have to make that call. But I do think that if you're going to operate in the contemporary cultural moment, particularly as an artist, you have to be familiar with what came before you. You just have to. And I think one of the ways hip hop has been beneficial to that is through sampling and looping, right? The way the way in which Public Enemy makes a song called Fight the Power that you danced to in 1975, that I danced to in 1991 or whatever, and I knew the Isley Brothers songs, my dad used to play it, right? But it wasn't my music in the way the Public Enemy was my music, and sort of the ways in which the generations met through that sample, I think is really one of the important contributions to hip hop. To the culture. Mm -hmm. but I just have to say, it's simply not true that all art is rebellious. It's just not the case. Maybe all the art that you make, and maybe the art that you make that your friends make is rebellious, but in the history of art, that's just not accurate. There's, there's something, there's always been something called neoclassicism. And the neoclassicist impulse is an impulse to save things that have come before, that are under threat. So as long as there are always people who are going to try to tear down everything that's come before as part of art, as rebellious against whatever previous generation was. But there are also people who are going to look back two generations and say, you know what, there was something important that's worth saving here. I think hip hop is an example of a culture that does both of them. Both of exactly. them are talking about. It tore down and remixed the past, but built upon the past to create the present and the future. Every major art form does both, in my opinion. But the art, there's one kind of, if you look at the 20th century art, you look at modernism, there's one kind of art that just tears down everything that's come before, but there's another kind of modernism that tries to protect something that's come before in poetry. So there's a kind of dialogue going on all the time in the arts between tradition and innovation. It's not just innovation, there's also tradition. And when you say, it's important, as I say to my poetry students, the history of poetry is matters too. And all the poetry you read should not be poetry that's just been written in the last three years. It's not crude, it's not important. You can't read only your contemporaries because you'll be writing just the way all your contemporaries are writing. You might want to remember that there are people who wrote poetry who aren't alive anymore. <laughs> you know, there was, there was um, one of the feminists, I don't know now who, who was writing about how to become a mature woman. And she said, you have, if you're a daughter, eventually your job is to tear your bones out of the, your mother's bones. And I would say it's another way of saying it sounds this. Sounds like you, Edward, uh, you have to know your hat, the past of your art. You have to know the grammar and the architecture of the past of your art if you want to be a revolutionary in your art. Beethoven was a revolutionary. People heard his music and ran out of the room saying it sounded like horrible garbage. 
So it's it's both at once. Yeah. yeah. Do you have another question? Yes. Uh, so do you do you guys think that with the rise of streaming sites and with basically people not really seeing music and necessarily most art as something that well more music because even though Netflix brings a lot, they still pay for ne like Netflix. A lot of people are hesitant to pay for the streaming sites still, at least from what I can talk to people. And for me, it wasn't hard because I always used to. I never did like LimeWire. I always used to buy MP3s, so this seemed actually like cheaper to me. So the uh, but a lot of people like are very hesitant to buy music, and I kind of, but. That's one one thing I was I wanted to ask about is like, is the is there a way to bring value back to music more than just in the concert setting, which it seems like where most hip hop artists make their money now? And then also, as a another point, is um, do you see this streamings and like YouTube and SoundCloud as a way to redistribute artistic authority from the richest and most popular to the people who have never been able to do it before? Um, so do this. There, there always are the pluses and minuses of every movement of every technology. But I do think one of the interesting things we've seen is that the horror to me as a professional musician of free streaming and the fact that you don't have to pay for music has had the unexpected consequence of meaning that once again, even major starring musicians are having to make their living by touring and being in rooms with human beings. The Beatles option, where you could simply stop performing live and become millionaires making your music in the studio, for better or worse, is disappearing. And we are getting into a world where any major musician has to go out and tour and perform live. It's one of the weird things that's happened right. with the new streaming technologies. So it's a circular, I mean, I think it's in every historical moment, if you, I'm a historian, it's what I do. And if you read old stuff, one of the first things you find is in every historical moment, people are going, oh my god, the sky is falling. Yeah. And the people changes. before me thought the sky was falling, but they were wrong. Now it's really It was called Gutenberg, for example. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, Gutenberg is a perfect example. It's wiped out storytelling. Yeah. And I mean, that yeah. is a reality. I mean, it is an absolute reality that storytelling, in a sense, the printing press was the apocalypse. And for live music, re records were, in a sense, the apocalypse. And that's real. I mean, thousands, hundreds of thousands of musicians were put out of work by recording. Um, and yet, <laughs> um, we're still here. And we're now nostalgic for that moment. So, you know, assuming that the world doesn't end, in a hundred years, people are going to be nostalgic for this moment as the moment before whatever is happening. Remember when we used to have streaming, they'll say? <laughs> <laughs> Your question actually makes me, um, I wasn't sure I'd be able to concentrate today. Um, yes. Because um, my perhaps my favorite artist of all time passed away today. Um, yeah. um, so like many people, I lost David Bowie and Prince in the span of what, four or five months. Um, and Prince was an artist who um, won't allow, wouldn't allow his stuff to be streamed, didn't let his stuff to get played on YouTube, right? Um, partly because he believed, A, if you want my music, my labor, you have to pay for it, A. And B, the best way to experience my art my labor is to come see me live on a stage with a guitar in my hand. And, and there's a I actually was wondering today if Prince's death in some way, what that's going to mean for the future of this, not the future of streaming writ large, but like this idea of this sort of one hook, this holdout, like the types of Beatles, the resistance, as it were, right? Um, so a moment of silence for Prince, everyone. I don't know if everyone here is a fan, probably not, but maybe. Um, but yeah, he's, a, he's someone who was actively resistant against the sort of um, the sort of immediate access of the internet and the way in which it shortchanged artists um, who 
This is their labor. This is what they do. Their livelihood, right? The way they feed their children, literally. Um, now being everywhere for free. Before everyone else leaves one by one, I really think we need to draw this to a final thing. To I say. wanted to ask a question about this. Um, was it in t was his resistance based on those practicalities or on the fact that if you went to a concert, you experienced the evening as an event, as a dramatic entity, and if you watch or listen on streaming, it's all in tiny little segments that don't necessarily. There were aspects of this. I actually saw a sonic loss that you experienced yeah. through um, um, the sort of press nature of streaming. And, and the and, here. Yeah, though, he was like definitely against that as well. Yeah, yeah. So thanks, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>